John Shaw and Steve. So did you see that? I will tell you, it's two and a half guys. John is so proud of you. I'm going to tell you, I'm watching you. I watch audiences very carefully. Oh, uh, Ray, he's kind of freaky. He's going to move this for a little while. And Gabe, yeah, okay. He's from North Dakota. He's going to work here. And when John spoke, and Steve, you guys were silent, and you guys were mesmerized. Were you not? Yes. Can't work here, right? That's what that young man, he came to my workshop. He blew me away. You know, because sometimes people will come to workshops and they go, yeah, 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 sure, sure. He followed everything. And remember what he told you. Please don't ever forget what he told you. You have to be a student. He has learned to be a student. And that's what it's going to take. Absolute commitment to be a student. Let's go down the journey. I'm going to tell you some more. Let's get into some real depth. Uh, again, this is a three-day course that we teach our MRCS employees. It's like drinking water out of a fire hose. I mean, we, we can't really go into depth. What we do is we do half-day lecture, half-day in the field. The chief of NRCS has actually mandated that we teach every NRCS employee. If you go in that office and they don't know about soil health, something happened. They should, they should be able to have a discussion with you, at least. The principal, we talked about this. Gabe has five, I have eight. Day one. What our systems now, now is we have fragile systems. Gabe's robust. Nature is anti-fragile. She is anti-fragile. There's a great book called by Tali. It's called Things That Gain From Disorder. And the other one, the black swan. He's a statistician, brilliant man, and he said, you know, there are exposure in societies, he calls these exposures, fragility, robustness, anti-fragile. If any scientist goes out and tells you they can predict things, he says, be very, very cautious. I'll give you a case in point. When they were trying to predict, when they were designing the walls for the Fukushima uh, disaster, remember how they out a way, they had brilliant engineers, statisticians, scientists, to say, okay, we're going to design the wall with height, and then we'll put a free board just for any big tsunamis. What happened? And over. We cannot predict, predict nature. She's complex. She's elegant. Young man comes up to me, he says, well, I hear the research is saying that you can run out of water. And then here comes John, and he says, now we can do that. What did Gabe and I tell you? Do not believe us. Follow the template. Follow the template. Be a student of nature. Be an observer. I had the same. You want to go broke? Watch your neighbor. Unless you, as your neighbor, army as nature does. We want to make, again, I'll stress this again, what's happened to us in our science is this, ladies and gentlemen. See, science is the lower form of knowledge. It just tells you, it shows you, it, what science really does is take away the myth from fact, but it's the lower form of knowledge. The lar larger and higher form of knowledge is understanding and wisdom. Understanding comes when it becomes personal, when you say, oh, now I understand. A huge difference. Oh, yeah, I get it. But I understand now. When John walked away from that workshop, he understood. That, and he did it. We just exposed him. He did the rest on his own. Now, we need to understand these concepts. One of the best books I ever read that helped me go down this journey was Holistic Management by Alan Savory. How many have read that book? That's an excellent book. That got me to say, oh, it started peeling the scales out of my eyes. Now, I'm going to tell you, it's a little weighty book. It's weighty, but be patient with yourself. I was ready. When I first bought the book, I wasn't ready for it. Then I started reading, because this is where Alan taught me understand the water cycle, the biocommunity dynamic the diversity cycle, carbon, nitrogen cycle, all those cycles are connected. 
This is a picture of secondary secession. We need to know what nature's doing. If you notice our farms are right here, farms are right here, when you stop farming, then the weeds come in, then shrubs, and it'll go back to prairie. If you live in North Carolina, it goes back this direction. She wants to go back that direction. So what we want to do, we can't eat wood, can't do that. The cycling in this type of system is very slow. It's designed for that way. But if I'm growing corn, and that I want a quicker nutrient cycling, I want to be here. Now these cycles here are getting really small because they're diminished. Our water cycle is not working completely. Our, our bio community dynamic cycle is not working. Our carbon and nutrient cycle are not working. And like John said, we're not capturing enough solar energy. So you need to understand what these processes are doing and where your context is. It's interesting. I used to do this too. We separate the farm from the prairie and we separate it from the woods. You're not supposed to do that. It is integrated together. The soil is the integrated. There's your farm. It was once the prairie. It was once the forest. It still wants to be treated that way. What you got to do is understand what the biology is doing. The biology here is very different from the biology here. This is bacteria dominant. We'll talk about that. This is more fungal dominant. We want to be here. This is leaky. This is not leaky. We'll talk about that. So you need to understand. So that when we, when we go to do our workshops and we go in the field, guess what we take out in the field? A shovel. A shovel. You should never be out there without a shovel. You've got to be searching. You've got to have, you've got to have this relationship with your so shovel, with your soil. So when I dig it, first thing I do is I, I smell it, and that earthy smell should be present, all created by actinobacteria. If you don't have smell there, something's wrong. I count the earthworms. Again, let's go, let me show you what I'm talking about. First thing we do when we go out in the field, I want to, I've showed you this, I want to see all these present. I want some cottage kind of cheese, earthworm, residue. If I go out to John's farm, all these spheres will be present. In a till system, a strip till system, that will not be present on all the, on all the fields. They won't be there. Those spheres are need to be present. All of them need to be there. Cottage kind of cheese, earthworm, roots, Cover, resident. I want to see it. You'll see it in grazing systems, you'll see it in forests, you'll see it in great healthy soil ecosystem. Remember, the cottage cheese is like the lungs of the soil. Look at that. This is Gabe Brown. Look at the cottage cheese on that field. I will look for those. And it takes energy to build that cottage cheese. It takes huge amounts of carbon. So if I don't see a present, rotation is poor, or you're doing way too much tillage. Got to be present. Now, again, I showed you already that. This is incredible picture. This is same particles fused into an aggregate. You look at the human lung, the ovulia, it looks very similar like that. The fungus is like the blood vessels. This is where the circulatory system happens. This is the aggregate is like the circulatory system, but it's like the air lungs of the soil. It's like the, it's like the breathing mechanism. These organisms reside in that. There are micro aggregates, and then there's macro aggregates. They're fused together by these biotic glues. Now I want you to look at these sand. Look at this sand particle. Look at the coat. It is coated with these organic mineral complexes. How many of you have sandy soil? Raise your hand. Okay. So how do we give our sandy soils the ability to hold on to cations? Ah, that coating. When I put that coating down biologically now, I improve my cation exchange capacity. I can, I regulate temperature. I have better maker potential. Now, they create the house. Make this very clear. When I left a graduate school in soils, it was chemistry physical, chemistry physical, chemistry physical. Very important. The way I look at it now, it is the biology that builds the house and helps regulate 
the chemistry. It's organic matter and all these organic mineral complexes that do that, ladies and gentlemen. The moment you say the word soil, the first thing that should come in your mind is alive. The alive. That's not what we were taught. These are very critical. That's what we're trying to build with these covers. And I cannot get people to understand. Yes, cover crops will take water. They use water. But you cannot feed biology and make organic matter without the plants and microbes. Period. So you have to manage the water. And then big storage. Okay, now, ladies and gentlemen, what is that a picture of? What does that look like? Looks like a lung, right? What is that? That's a root with mycorrhizal fungus. Nature works in holes and patterns. That's broccoli. That's our put our fluid mycorrhizal fungus. Do you see that thing? That is called fractals. Mathematical fractals. If you see a tree, it has fractals. Why should I care with my farm? Patterns. Nature works in holes and patterns. Once you start observing that, you start looking at nature very differently. She's elegant, she's beautiful, and she follows patterns. This one I told you already. Plant is solar one. This is how we build more vescular or briscular microbial fungus. Remember what Gabe was saying, some of the things that hurt the fungus. You guys remember that? I see you guys are falling asleep. Killage? Too much phosphorus? Too much chemical fertilizer? You're not feeding it enough? So why should you care? Look at the difference with no vascular microbial, no BAM. Look at the plant with the BAM. Some people say, well, Ray, why don't you put these little things in the bottle? Can't we put these kind of cool stuff in the bottle and just start off fresh? Look at fallow system. Hmm, how many advanced spores are we building in a fallow system? Canola. Ollie. Chicken. Look at wheat. Sarger. Maize. Sunflower. Chickpea. Now, what if we make an eight or ten way base out of that? You see where we're going with it? Now, I'm providing habitat and food for these fungus. Now they'll be able to make phosphorus more available. They'll help me get through the drought. Diversity is simple. Some people want to put it in a bottle. The moment you put a seed into that soil, this is what happens. The plant starts making relationships, start boring this arbus from mycorrhizae in there. They start sending these cool chemicals and starts communicating to the plant. And say, plant, microbe, plant saying, microbe, I'm here. Let's have relationship. And then when you see that sugar, this is right here, ladies and gentlemen. This is why John is doing this. Then you bring life. Then come the bacteria. I call bacteria the gazelles of the soil. Everybody eats gazelles. It sucks to be born a bacteria of the gazelle. They come, there's the bacteria, they're grazing, like they're grazing under udder. Here's the sugars, the protein, the carbohydrates. That's the carbon. That is plant. Cover crops are going to be called biological primers. I do not like the name cover crop. They're much more important. They are energy transformers, biological primers. What you're doing is you're priming the soil. Engineers, oh, I'll show you a little while, continue. This is what I want. All of us focus on everything on the top. The real game is going down here. Amino acids. Plants can take up amino acids. And guess what's in an amino acid? A nitrogen molecule. Do you mean plants can take up organic game? Yeah. Organic acids, sugars, vitamins, purines. Remember when we did the skunk test? That's what is in here. That's what we're talking about. Here's an excellent book. 
called the Rising Sphere. It's about three to four hundred pages just on Rising Sphere exudates. Now, let me warn you, if you buy that book, it is heavy. Think about it. But it's awesome. It's a book of awesomeness. But I'm kind of geeky. Some of you might not want to read this book. <laughs> Diffusiates sugars. It makes sugars, organic acids, amino acids, excretions. Look at the protons, electrons, secretions, enzymes, electrons. See this right here? Natural herbicide, aliochemicals. That's what they are. They're called negative communication. Plants will say, don't get too close to me. They'll secrete these. If we learn how to use the right crop, we can actually suppress weeds. Straight away. one. This is the new release, slow release fertilizer bag. And you know what I like about it? Don't have to put it in a bottle. I don't have to pay a premium. It's called a bacteria. This is why I cover my soils at the end of the year. I want them to come to the party and hold my nutrients in the micro. I want nutrients in the body of microbes, and I want it in the body of a root. I don't want free nitrate leaking all over the place. Then I have to go write a check at the co-op. <coughs> this is the new slow-release fertilizer pack. Look at the herbicide, natural herbicide that nature uses. This is North Dakota, this is spring weed. If you design your right mix, I just say a herbicide application. Pretty cool. Now, once you build a huge microbial biomass, look what happens. This was taken in a picture in France. Very sandy soil. On the left side, conventional till soil. On this side, no till. Same soil. Audience, why is there less snow on the no till? Why? Is that the compaction? No, compaction. Biological activity. You cannot compare a no-till field to a conventional. They're total different animals. The microbial biomass in some healthy no-tills can weigh almost as much as 2, 2,500 pounds. In some healthy pastures, we've had 10,000 pounds of microbial biomass in organisms on an acre. They're responding. You've got to feed the beast. Healthier your soils, the more carbon you have to feed it, and the more they cycle. So when I look at any grass system, when I go look at any rain, when I go look at any type of system, in fact, I used to mold my. We need to understand this canopy, this biological framework, these plants. You got to protect and have as much solar panel as possible. Look what happens when you overgraze. See, now I mow my grass like this. I live in an acre and a half, got a subdivision, and I want to throw, I want to put uh, crimson clover and vetch in the front yard. <laughs> How do you think the neighbors looked at me? I'm walking down the neighborhood and say, Greg, why don't you mow your grass? I said, you don't understand. I am trying to build a rhizosphere. <laughs> They said, no, they're lazy. <laughs> I said, get over up and goats. <laughs> Luckily, I'm so with agriculture. Why do you think I bought into that subdivision? Be careful how you manage your solar panels. When it gets too hot, weeds pop out of here. The biggest enemy on your place is bare ground. Then the scabs come up. I'll show you. Here are the scabs. I'm going to show you, there's a good book called Guardians of the Soil. You need to write that down. Guardians of the Soil. Weeds. I no longer look at weeds as the enemy. See, another book you ought to get is, how many of you read the book called One Star Revolution? I recommend that book. It's got one called Seeding the Desert by Uka Oka Ma Masanubu Uka Oka. I know I butchered that one a big time. Why do I know him? Well, let's take a right first place. He's a Japanese guy. He taught me something very, I learned a lot from him. 
One of the things he said, the moment you call a plant good or bad, you're lost. Everything is good. You just don't know the purpose of it. Do you know that weeds can bore down our feet and bring up calcium back into the soil? Do you know some of them are 24% protein? Do you know that certain weeds can actually stimulate corn production? Oh, yeah. I don't look at weeds like that anymore. See, when I came out of college, they made me They say they're a plant out of place. No. They're a plant we put there because of our ignorance. Do you see them there in the healthy forest? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're not there, are they? The way you look at business, now look at this. I call weed nature's first responders, like the paramedic and the police. And there's, a, there's a disturbance in the forest. When I look at rangeland that's overgrazed, the scabs will be up. I look at pasture, too much weed, the scabs are up. If you're killing too much, here comes the humors. They're telling you something. You got a calcium deficiency, zinc deficiency, the scabs will tell you something. Now, it is very disturbing when you can't even get the scabs to grow. I saw Phil like that in North Carolina with continuous tobacco. Uh, continuous tobacco. So you know how the farmers brought it back in North Carolina? Like almost bringing Lazarus from the dead? No, you're one good. Conifer spruce trees. They are heavily mycorrhizal. They were able to, the fungus were able to bring the last bits of fertility and get a foothold. Then the carbon cycle started to get. But they had to wait 20 years after that. You don't want to go down that road. Here's the scabs. Overgrazing. Forget the fun. You, you reduce uh, fungal biomass, you reduce infiltration, you, you decrease. You increase the temperature, you hurt the soil engineers, and then you go buy more chemical inputs. Which is a mistake. Now, let's see if this is going to work for me. When I came out of college, this is what I walked away with. This model. All our agriculture is based on this model when you talk to agronomists. The inorganic based soluble state model. The way I walked away, I said, okay, I got my fertilizer bag, I got plants, and got the mineralogy, and then you get the soil water, and very enough freezing in there. And you got mass flow, interception, you hope the plant intercepts it, mass flow, your water's bringing it up, and then diffusion between the minerals, and all these caverns are flowing everywhere. I actually walked away with that concept that that's what's happening. And I got in an argument with a soil chemist, I said, really, is that really doing it like that? Because of this model, back here, we are losing 40 to 60 percent of our end and pay. We're paying for it. You guys are paying for this. Our ground lays bare four to eight months because it's easy to go buy chemical fertilizer. We have decoupled the carbon and nitrogen phosphorus cycle. Now let's see if I can make this work. This is what I want you to see. This is their world, and they help regulate that chemistry through organic matter. It's called the Organo Mineral Pool Ecological Place Nutrient Management. There is a paper you need to write down. It's called by Dr. Drinkwater. Just type Dr. Drinkwater from Cornell. It is an excellent paper. It's called, I think it's the um, new way of, I think it's called Ecological Nutrient Management. But just like Dr. Drinkwater from Cornell, and that paper comes up and it is awesome, where she is questioning a lot of a scientists are questioning this model. We are questioning it. We're saying, no, this is the model. Okay, producers, get this right, Dave will buy you a beer. See how nice I'm tired of giving money. Look at this research here. They've done, when they put continuous corn, what percentage of fertilizer actually gets up into the, into the corn. They did radioisotopes. In other words, they put this nuclear radioisotope that followed it all the way up the plant, and, and they put it on the end, radioisotope of end, and they followed it all the way up to the plant. 
audience, how much actual of that in actually reached the planet? Give you a guess. 50 percent? 10 percent? 30. 30, that's pretty close. 40 to 50 percent. So what happened to the other 50 or 60 percent? You spent $800 a ton for or $1,000 a ton back in 2008. What happened to it? Some of the gold guys, what else did happen to it? Hey, what's the winner of the gold? Some of it goes to the mafia. <laughs> Micro to the mafia. They're the first feeders, ladies and gentlemen. Then they release it. Plants are not the first feeders. Soil feeds the plants. Nitrogen provides nitrogen, which completes protein synthesis. Some of it gets tied up. Some of it gets volatilized, some of it gets denitrified, but it's the mafia who controls it. You've got to pay them first. Mm -hmm. That's going to happen. This is what I've come to the conclusion is the keystone nutrient carbon. It's all about carbon. Here, where it's very, very brittle, you've got to keep carbon on hand. You've got to feed it. You've got to give the beast carbon. If you give it carbon, all these other trace minerals will become available by the biology. Of course, if you have been using chemical fertilizer and you've been leaching it for years, you're probably going to have to haul some of the calcium stuff back. Tillage is very destructive. When you destroy the integrity of the soil and it's not there, you may not be able, you might not have access to that. So what you're going to have to do is balance it together, the biology with the chemistry. Let me show you how harmful carbon is. This is Albuquerque, New Mexico. I grew up north, 75 miles north of Albuquerque. My state of his buddy, Rudy Garcia, Rainer our yes, this is his backyard. That's pretty rough. It's sand. You've been there. That's Rio Rancho. It should be called Real Death. <laughs> because that's his backyard. It sucks. Now look what he did. See, I am convinced that we would listen to our wives and be further ahead. His wife is going on YouTube and says, Rudy, why don't you get some wood chips? And he says, okay. So he went and got wood chips. She was kind of a little upset with it because he got the colored wood chips. She just wanted regular wood chips because she learned if you put wood chips on the top, you can suppress meat, and you can have excellent gardens by using wood chips. Sure enough, where he put that one inch of wood chips, everything grew beautifully. Look at the desert, look at the wood chips. That four wing salt brush just blossomed. Watermelon, where Rudy was eating watermelon in the past, it came up by itself, a little fertilizer. The squash came up. Look at the watermelon and all that by just that one inch of precious wood mulch. So then I said, wow, carbon is so precious. What if we got all a big giant machine and yank all the mesquite out and make tiny wood chip and put it back in the range and bring it and store back our range? And some of you are saying, whoa, man, you smoke way too cut the crops. <laughs> But ladies and gentlemen, think about how we can restore carbon back to the system. Do you know what this is called? Hugo culture. I really started researching that putting wood chip on top of the surface, you can have magnificent gardens, hold the moisture, but you do not incorporate them. You leave them on the surface. And the moment you incorporate, what happens? You tie up nitrogen. You want to do that. So you have these precious fungus, apophytic fungus, mycorrhizal, the borders, the wood chips, and right under there, look at the dark layer we had. We have this really, look at, this, look at the dark layer starting to turn, that sand. We were amazed. Okay? Taught me something very important. Look at this. Death, life. Death, life. So here's what I'm saying. That precious 
One means of the soil is so precious, ladies and gentlemen. That carbon is so critical. We stopped out at Scott Ray again, didn't we, John? But were you there? No, I was with Scott by himself. It was interesting. Where he's got a really cool picture of where the residue created that nice layer and where the wheat came up. The wheat was this high, and where there was no residue, the wheat went like this up, down. And they were a foot apart. Made that much difference. Now, here's the thing I want you guys to remember. This is a very nitrogen, this is a very leaky system. Our soil is a very leaky, very heavy till, very bacteria dominant. We want to be here in balance. Again, this system needs more ammonia. This is very high in nitrates. It's also, we have a lot of nitrate uh, ammonia in there in that system. This system is here. This system is plant, plant control, very fast cycling, bacteria dominant, very exploitative. This system of prairies and forests are very conservative, fungal dominant, slow. Prairies would be here, so they'd be more balanced. Forests are very fungal dominant. In fact, they're so slow. They've done studies, the moment they cut chemical forests down, guess what happened? They changed the biology, and then all of a sudden, the local stream, when they get forested in that area, got a flush of nitrate. Changed the biology. That Those little spruce trees, conifer things falling down on the bottom, have heavy thinnels, and they change the chemistry. The forest wants it very slow. They want to control it. They don't want a leaky system. We want here, in the balance, in the middle. Here's another way of showing you another one. This is called dissolved organic nitrogen. Our no-till systems head more to this kind of balance. Most of our systems are nitrate and ammonia. We want to be right here. Dissolved. We want to be able to access these pools. Okay, now, let me tell you what soil test we are using now to be able to access those pools. By using the Rick Haney test, I'm going to talk about that the most, the Sovita. One of my producers with one soil sample will save $60,000 of fertilizer. One soil sample saving sixty dollars This test is $75. So if somebody complains about a $75 for a soil test, don't call me. Please don't call me. Because you're going to want about $75 to save thousands. No. There's another one called the phospholipid fatty acids. I will use all these tests if I'm a good practitioner and I have a problem, I will use a lot of the tests. Right now, right now, we don't have enough time. Again, this is a whole one day session just on that alone. Talk about it, but I'm going to focus just on the Haney test for now. Dr. Haney and I met each other about three to four years ago. He works for ARS. He's a soil microbiologist and soil chemist. Dr. Wood, Woodson Laboratory, Dr. Will Brinton, this is how the test looks if you take it from Woodson Laboratories. You're going to have Woodman's Laboratory will give you the regular university. Also, Ray Ward does this test, but you have to ask for the Haney test. Have to ask for it specifically. Okay? But I like about what Will did, he puts it in a chart in a high chart form. These are the two soils. You see the soil right here? This is, these are, this is one soil here, and this is one soil here. It will tell you in pipe chart what the forms of organic pools. This one says this is an amino acid. Look at the pool of the amino acid. So these all the other pools within that we've never had access to. This is the food web analysis. This is about $150 to $200. This, what they'll do is they'll, Count all the printers, very expensive, very laborious, that it's very good to tell you that to, to tell you all the critters that are present, all the predators, and it gives you how much it is in the system. It also tells you the balance of bacteria and fungus, very good test. Now it's a little spendy, about 150 to 200 dollars I would do that if I'm doing a benchmark condition and I want to know where I'm at. Now, what do I like about the Haiti test? 
Pretty simple. Remember how I've been pushing biomimicry? Dr. Haney did a bunch of research that says, hey, if the major substrates in the soil is water and root exudates, wouldn't it make sense that we make our soil test from that same extractant instead of using caustic materials called the Bray, the Malik, and the Morgan? They use, does it rain in hydrochloric acid? Does it rain ammonium fluoride? So why are we using the extractant and forcing the soil to tell us something? Well, why don't we just let it speak to us by using biomimicry? This is what got me so excited. Because what it does, it uses root exudates as the extractant and water. And what I like about it, it adjusts to the, uh, to the plants and microbial mediated process. The problem is, it is huge to the lab. There are six to ten labs now. There's a couple of labs from Europe calling. These, this hay test is really, really taking hold. NRCS has done thousands of samples, and we are doing different, a lot of projects. I mean, you're part of it, right, Dale? So Dale in Kansas is part of it. And how many else have been doing that with NRCS? How many NRCS employees do you have here? Raise your hand, please. Have you, any of you else been working with the hay test, guys? We have a couple more. What I like, I get to see soil samples from all over the country. All the way from North Carolina, South Carolina, everywhere. They send them to me, and we've been observing a wonderful pattern. Show you a little while. Here's how it works. I want you guys to think about it, because I, I know that David said, you know, Ray, this is going to be pretty heavy. This, uh, and I said, yeah, well, let's give it a try and see if I screw it up. And I wanted to see, okay, now let's imagine all of us are a bunch of microbes, okay? And we're all living in this aquatic system floating around. Now, Dale didn't make it. I mean, we're going to talk about Dale here a little while. He's been doing with microbes. In the way we've known since the early turn of the century, when soils get wet and dry, wet and dry, there's a release of nutrients. They have known this, the Russians knew this years and years ago in the turn of the century. Uh, wetting and drying, wetting and drying, and wetting and drying. So when you guys get that rain, you get this flush of rain up. Some people attribute it to the rain. A little bit of nitrogen, but really it's this process called wetting and drying. This is done in College Station. The soil here with less fertility. It's called a one-day CO2 burst. That means the microbes are respiring. After they get a flush of water, <laughs> they start going. This one had more fertility. Look at that CO2 burst. And the amaryllis still had the highest fertility. So let's think of this. Okay, it's been dry, you have no, it's been fallow, and all of a sudden, some of us die, Dale dies, some of you survive, you start eating on Dale. And you, everybody starts chewing until you find carbon, the floating, and everything, the respiration is way up after the water comes back. Very cool. We know now how to measure that CO2 respiration, which adds to fertility. So think about this. In the soil, if you're a bacteria, there you don't die of old age. Somebody eats you, chews, somebody's blood, some urine, whatever they have, everybody gets eaten. So that's what this is measuring. Then they send this very sophisticated lab. He's got his lab there. Everything is in the water solution. He uses the extractant and it measures from the N and the P, and that's why it goes with this very sophisticated equipment. Now, it is based on these seven parameters, and it comes up with a soil health score. There's the CO2, I already explained that, except for organic carbon, talked about that a little while, and percent mat. This is the efficiency of the microbes to process the carbon. Organic in, in water, in water, inorganic N and and the carbon nitrogen ratio and the organic N and ratio. Now, we have changed this. Anything less than seven, when you get a soil health score and your soil health score is less than seven, your soil, your soil is not doing well. But what's most important about this test is it is spot on for telling you how much nitrogen you have in the system. 
That's what I like about this text. Let me explain that. Oh, wow. Remember, it is the organisms that break this down. They take the big molecules, make them into smaller molecules, and they leak into the soil, and it becomes humic acids and all the things. It's caught up, and that machine, that Hades test, is be able to pick up those molecules. That active carbon pore. It's all about those carbon pores. It's coming from the roots, and it's coming from the residue. Now, to make it very clear, this residue only adds to organic matter only 35%. 60 to 70% of it goes out into CO2. Do you see why not just having residue enough? That have to be roots. Now, here's the amino acid again. I know this is kind of waiting. We'll show you a little bit and then we'll wrap it up. I'm not going to give you too much on it. Again, this is pretty, uh, it's taking me three years to feel comfortable with this. Organic matter, total organic matter is the building. It's the structure. It's everything. Total organic matter. What this test measures is the food. When I was in California, there is a place where they, part of California, they have 10% organic matter. Soil scientists says to me, Ray, I don't know how they were going to help them. They got 10% of them. And I said, well, are the soils cycling on their own? He goes, well, no. I said, I don't care how much of any you have. If your soils are not cycling, you're still having to buy fertilizer. It's like living in a big house and eating hot dogs at the end of sausages every day, and life sucks. <laughs> they drive the system. You can have 10%, you can't get a little 5,000 square foot home. If you're eating hot dogs, life's not that great. This test measures the active carbon in water solution. If I know how much food, I know how much work I'm going to get out of it. How much nitrogen they're going to mineralize. So 1% would be 6,000 parts per million carbon, 2,000. So look how it's 80, 100 times smaller than this pool of food. So why have we been so far off? Our tests were based on old science. We've been missing this whole pool, ladies and gentlemen. Right here, the organic end. We've been missing over half the end. See, our tests were only picked up this pool. So when we went, you see, you know how it started for me? I was, I, it was, it, I started to realize when we went to the donkey farm, I started going all over the country, and I saw these very, very healthy soils. Get the university soil sample, says, put 200 pounds of more in. And I go, what? No way. That plant's green. It's beautiful. He's using the manure. He's using multi-species carbon. But it doesn't need any nitrogen. And yet, you did the university soil test, and it said, add more nitrogen. I said, that's wrong. So now, we're using that. So here, we're going to give you a little clarification of the active pool. Active pool of carbon is like, oh, like a donut. Something that can be processed really quick. This is the steak. Five to 40 years to break it down. And this is the stable organic matter. That's like a bone. It's hard to take up a thousand years to process that. Now, nutrient cycling is based on this. Most of it is based on the active pool. See how important that is? And then some of it from the resistant organic matter, and then some of it we can get it from the bone. So how do you get this, some of this only organic matter to be metabolized? The way they do it is when you put new residue, you're putting the nerves, you're putting chemicals, you're priming the soil, and the soil microbes, there's 15,000 to millions of species in there that are incredibly resilient. They can process some of that bone. That's called priming the soil. Okay? Now, remember, this, remember the soil that held very well together? That is Ray Steyer soil. Look how much active carbon. 347. The one that fell apart, 160. Why well, should I care? All of it is connected. It impacts aggregation, it impacts nutrient cycling, water holding capacity. All of it's connected. Okay? Now, we're getting close. I know you guys are going, oh, this is too much. Hey, I want to give you your money's worth, right? All right. 
hanging out. Mississippi, I have a young soil scientist, works for NRCS, he says, Ray, I love this. I've got to get empirical data so I can give my farm and encourage you to go down this direction. So what she did, is she went and sampled the corn no-till, I call corn no-till, corn and soybean, Happy Road University, corn tillage, conventional tillage, no-till and cover crops. Now this is Mississippi, sandy soils, silty sand, some really nice soils, very humid, about 50 some inches. That we're seeing the same response all over the country. I don't care where you're at, we're coming out with the same results. I want you to focus on this, just these two columns. No till and cover crop, pasture, and forest. So what she did is she took samples from each, the forest, the pasture, the no till and covers, only two years of no till. Okay, now this is the university soil test. In the poor no till, it said you had 11 pounds. The hay said, no, you got 15 pounds. Conventional tillage, 10 pounds through the university soil sample. And he said, no, you got 16 pounds. Now, look what happened the morning we could cover crops, ladies and gentlemen. University said 2.5. And he said, you got 15. Now, let's multiply that by 2,000 acres. But as you go, G for G. Yeah, now look at this. When, see, when you start going into no till and cover crops, your system's going into a dynamic equilibrium like the pasture in the forest. Look at the pasture, 4.7. Now, look at the Haiti test, 75 pounds. The forest, 11, 70. You see how we're saving thousands of dollars? Thousands of dollars landowners are saving by using this test. Oh, so when do I take this? I take it just before I go plant my corn or whatever I'm going to put out there. So I give myself a two or three week window. So when I got corn at V6, V8 stage, eventually the man's going to be huge. I'll take it at V4. I got to wait for my hay test to come back. Okay? Give yourself a window. You got to, and you've got to ask for the hay test. Here's another one. If you don't want to do the test, this is pretty good for field. We're going to, I've done this quite a bit. Here is a little glass jar with a paddle. It is done by Woods End Laboratory. That little paddle turns color. It has special pigments that react to the CO2 that's embedded. Embedded into the CO2, it tells you, and give us a good estimation, of CO2 respiration by also nitrogen. That is an aluminum tube about six inches, the width of this. So when you first go buy the paddle from the Woods and Laboratory, you collect the soil, put it in there, but I prefer doing this in situ. That's a fancy word to say, in the field. You put it right by the corn plant, or your milo, or whatever you're doing. Stick it in the field, wrap it with plastic, nothing escapes, and put a coffee can on the top. This is the way, the best way to collect it. You can do it in field, or this way. It's like a big old biscuit. You know, like you make a biscuit. Now, there's a reason we want the whole chunk undisturbed. Why is that, class? What happens if you just crush it up and put it in a little glass container? You stimulate the tillage. And then you're, you're going to get erroneous answers because you just prime the soil and release nitrogen and all this, and you're way off. You burn that house to warm up a hot dog. I told a guy, one of the ranchers said, Ray, I'm going to still till because I get a release of nitrogen. I said, yep, you burn the house to warm up a hot dog. It better turn the grill on. So do it that way. Now, you're going to get a little, you're going to get a little color chart. If your soil comes back at, z at zero, call your soil Lazarus. It's dead. It's not actually really bad, but it's pretty good. Ray Steyer's soil is five. And then he's got another chart that correlates to how much nitrogen, rough, rule of thumb, Ray soil had 180 to 200 pounds of N. All he did is do that little, pretty, pretty close. So if you don't have time and use those, we've been pretty happy with this. But the Haney test is more accurate. 
Okay, you send it to the lab. Now, how do you collect it? You collect it six inches. You know, if you have an 80 acre field, 40 acres is very sandy, treat the, and the other 40 acres is clay, treat them as separate units. Take about 30 or 40 cores from the sandy, 30 to 40 cores on the clay. Mix it in the five gallon bucket. Send a couple of pounds, send it to the laboratory. On an 80 acre field, you spend 150 bucks. Six inch dip. Everybody with me? Not eight, not ten, six. Because if you don't do it six, you dilute it. Now, you saw that chart already? Now, let's talk real quick about designing mixes, and Dave's going to wrap it up. Designing mixes. When I design mixes, this is what I do. We, we talk about your resource concerns, everything else. Here's a great paper that was written by Dr. David Tillman. When I was learning about the mixes, I said, wow, I've got to find some research to help find out, you know, to kind of fine-tune this. And once I learned how to do mixes, Gabe taught me, Gabe, it was Jay Fuhrer, uh, John Sticka, and then just doing my own experience, and then learning and doing all the research. This is a great paper called The Influence of Functional Diversity by Dr. David Tillman. What he did is he got, his Dr. David Tillman did studies in aquariums. He had graduate students picking up species out there, and which one impacted the aquariums with increased biomass. Here, I this one backwards. Oops. I'm missing my diversity one. Did I get the car? Ah, I'm missing one. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, I hope you this. When we put five to eight in the mix, the biomass went up. You see that, John? This is why, because I asked Jay, I said, Jay, you're in this very dry brittle. Well, I'm going to recommend it minimal. And Jay, which is, he didn't know that I, was, I had this paper. He said eight. I said, whoa, what? Spot on. Five to 15, we saw that. Gabe, anything more than 50? Did you see anything more than that? Any more response in biomass above 15? No, not for biomass. They a <laughs> functional group. Functional groups are the broadleaves, or the dunes, all those. I love, at the minimum, just a little fun, about three dunes in my eight to 15 species to feed the rest of them, if I can. Okay? It's kind of a rule of thumb, but, but keep in mind, you've got to take other things on the factor. I'm going to graze it. Well, what are you going to do? What's the next crop coming over? There's lots more into it. Now, I'm going to run over some basic things I want you to think about. If you're going to do covers, you've got to do what John does and Steve. You become a committed student, an observer. If you're not willing to become a student and observer, don't do this. Because you're going to go to the coffee shop, because you're doing it half hearted, and you're going to diss a practice that can make it sustainable. Please don't do it. Just go pay the fertilizer and herbicide bills and do what you do. Please. Be patient and don't go cold turkey. Did you notice what John said? I get 20 acres. And expect failure. You're going to fail. But you don't give up. Right, John? See, you didn't give up, did you? It took 100 years of disruption, and you want to fix it with the magic cover crops. It is not the cover crops. It's not the no-till. It's understanding. If you heard what John's become as a student and observer, this has been the magic bullet. It's called thinking and managing. You are dealing with a very complex ecosystem, ladies and gentlemen. Farmers and ranchers should be the brightest on the planet. You are dealing with a very complex ecosystem. Give us three to five years at the minimum. Here's by a little longer. And here, Dave and I got it, you need to put brandy. You need to bring livestock. In the west, you can get up the further east, the more moisture you can get away with. You can get a quicker response because of water. The soil is run by water. Find a mentor or build a community of believers. John gave his phone number. Steve, these guys talk together. 
Nobody should be in your group unless they have drank the soil health Kool-Aid. <laughs> Do not have them in your group. I'm serious. In my, I have my own group in North Carolina. Everybody went to my class. Nobody's allowed in the class unless you have the holistic thought process and gone through the deep programming process. Because you're not going to be beneficial. You won't get it. You'll be like a person licking ice cream behind a windshield. Looks like strawberry. Uh, never get it. <laughs> you're going to go, nah, 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 nah. I don't want you in there. You're going to be argumentative and you're not ready. You've got to go to the, the, the program instruction. I make it very clear you need a mentor and a community. Right? And guess what? We got some of our DCs that get together and they'll have breakfast and they talk soil health. What are we going to do next? What are we going to do? I had my group say, you guys bring the steaks, I'll provide the rest. Good deal. They come to the house and we sit and we visit. We're going to have another meeting in March. I got tired of being kind of the gossiper between all the farmers and I said, no, 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 let's all come to the house, let's visit. We all learn from each other. John, thank you for telling the group. We're no longer competing with ourselves. We're competing with the world. So help mentor each other. You're the number other one. Don't do this unless you're organized. I am the most disorganized person you can ever meet. People tell you. In fact, my wife will tell you, she gives, she wants to put a little stamp on me right here. And she says, would you please send my husband home? He gets lost easy. <laughs> I did, I flew to the wrong city. <laughs> That's because I'm being in some of my clothes. <laughs> I'm a geeky that way. Geeky. But here's the thing. As you're going to the harvester, what did John tell you? Who's got the no-till draw money behind you? Cut down your varieties. Every minute counts. Don't do this half-hearted. Really put the effort out and be committed. That poor young man that came up to me says, Well, the universe is going to suck all the water. I said, Don't trust me. Follow the template. Be committed. Get organized. Know that you're committed. If you're not going to treat your cup of cups like your commodity, don't do it. Don't do it. You don't understand. <laughs> Have a transition period. Know your equipment, know your tools, study the cover crops. We have a cover crop calculator that Keith Burns provide. Keith is a brilliant resource. There are a lot of people here that have experience. Steve also back there. Some of our DC build community. If I'm transitioning the person from conventional no to you're probably going to have to bump up your nitrogen 20% so that you don't have those yield drops. When we promoted no-till, we just promoted the drill, and that poor farmer went out there, I bought the drill, it collapsed in his face, and they gave up. I met some farmers in the pandemic of Texas, and they said, Ray, we're going to leave no-till. We're going to convention. I said, why? He said, this cost is just as much as convention. I said, what's your location? Tobacco. No, I mean cotton. Cotton, really, what else? Cotton. And what else? Cotton. <laughs> no wonder you're failing. If you read, what was the, uh, Gabe, what was the book between Thomas Jefferson and George Washington called the Garden Book, wasn't it? When Thomas Jefferson and George Washington would call each other, talk to each other, like others. Back in the early 1700s, they would complain and moan. Even back then, all farmers wanted to do is grow corn. Monoculture, way back then. It, it doesn't leave our blood. We just love monoculture. And then Gabe's going to talk to you about later on today or tomorrow about second operations becoming more resilient, right? Tomorrow? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, you need to hear Gabe. Unless you're still talking. See, I get I'm not over my time, am I? <laughs> no way. Oh, my goodness. I'm done. Okay, I didn't know. Did I go over? Oh, good idea. Yeah. You gotta make sure he's checking the clock. Okay, one more thing. Let's go here. La, 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 la. Okay. 
I recommend this book called The Seven Habits of Effective People. Um, I was going to say something nice about Gabe, but it's over now. <laughs> Actually, Gabe and a lot of the top producers are applying the habits of seven habits of effective people. I went and bought that book years ago. I didn't get it. I bought it again. And what I love about this book, it talks about people like Gabe that are very proactive. They have the end in mind. They synergize. They sharpen the saw. They want, and they're teachers and they're givers. Learn that because that book will teach you to put things first, to be organized, to put things right in perspective. So again, you cannot build ecological integrity unless you build human integrity. Thank you, guys.